Hi, I'm Jeff Hilland, uh, Distinguished Technologist at Hewlett Packard Enterprise and SPDM Working Group Co-Chair, as well as DMTF President. I'm here to provide an overview of SPDM version 1.4. Just to let you know, this is a, a standard disclaimer page for our DMTF. The information you're seeing right now represents a snapshot of work in the DMTF. We're always updating our specs, um, doing any errata or changes, uh, as well as major and minor version uh, development. And um, so you need to see the specification for the absolute canonical truth of any of the information presented in any of our YouTube series. The agenda for today is to go over a quick background of SPDM. If you're familiar with this, you can skip right ahead to the SPDM 1.4 features and impact, which will be covered after the background. So if you've been following SPDM for a while, we've been uh, developing the standard for about five years. You're probably fairly familiar with the uh, platform security environment. Certainly software has its own level of security. And yet if the hardware and firmware underneath it is compromised, that software infrastructure can be compromised as well. So the kind of attack vectors we see is everything from attacks via fabric, uh, hostile device insertion, compromise of the supply chain, some sort of firmware, uh, malware uh, stuck in the machine somehow inserted, um, you can snoop via probes, substitute existing devices, all those kinds of things. And then when you get out under the fabric, particularly other things can happen as well. What we're developing here is an infrastructure that uh, prevents all of that. So really our features fall into at least one of these main categories. Either we're doing device assist attestation and authentication or secure communication over any transport. And that list of transports is growing. When it comes to device attestation and authentication, we are providing the ability to attest various aspects of the device, such as is it who it says it is, is it manufactured by who it says it is, and is the firmware load on that device what you're expecting. We're also providing secure communication over any transport. We are pedantically mapping it to MCTP and the infrastructure that we know over you know, I2C, USB, I3C and other uh, transports. Um, but we're also mapping it to other transports and I'll go over what they are in a second. And we're working with various industry partners <clears throat> to ensure that data in flight is secure for any part in the infrastructure, what we call the control plane, as well as the data plane. So the whole point is to not only attest and authenticate the device, but then allow secure communication to and from that de device over both the management plane and the control plane. And then lately, we've added one more set of overall goals, and that's to support the latest cryptography standards. For those of you aware of the NIST guidelines, um, that's made a major impact in the security arena. And um, when it comes to post-quantum cryptography, uh, we're supporting those algorithms as well. I'm not going to go into a, a lesson on why PQC uh, algorithms are important. There are many training videos out there uh, available on that. So previously, we've done a lot of work on SPDM over the last half a decade. Uh, version 1.0 was just measurements, device attestation, and authentication. In version 1.1, we added key exchange so that we could uh, add a way of doing either uh, secure communication, encrypted communication, as well as mutual authentication. In 1.2, we entered this, added a standard way to install certificates and allowed for alias certificates as well. Um, for some of you might be aware of some of the efforts in TCG, that was what that was intended to support. We added large uh, SPDM messages as well because um, some of these messages we were sending were pretty big chunks. And so we entered a, added a chunking mechanism as well as uh, additional algorithms. New OIDs were added to uh, uh, map to things in the industry. And then we deprecated mutual authentication uh, via challenge and challenge auth. Um, certainly no need to carry that forward and everything in 1.0 and 1.1 should give you what you need if you're interested in that. In version 1.3, we added some um, more advanced features, eventing, so that the protocol can send events and let you know when certain uh, events transpire. We added multi-key, and that is uh, because it's a good security practice to use different keys for different scenarios. So we added the ability for uh, a... Um, device to support more than one key per algorithm. We added generic certificates to help with supply chain issues. We added MEL, MEL, and HEM um, 
for ways of, of tracking changes in the device, such as firmware updates, and knowing they're attested to before you go and reset the device. And then we added endpoint info because MCTP has ways of finding out what is at that other end and what's supported. Um, but not everything that's transporting SPDM had that behavior. And, and you kind of need that information right up front uh, before you start um, authenticating and attesting to the device. So we added that in 1.3 so that any of the supporting protocols could get that functionality. We've also added our own bindings. We started out with MCTP to SPDM so that you could do the SPDM key, ex uh, key exchange and all the rest uh, over MCTP and the physical transports it binds to. And then in 1.1, we added both secured messages and secured messages to SPDM. Those two specs to go together if you're implementing encrypted messages over MCTP, but some of our alliance partners like the PCI SIG and CXL for data transformation, they don't use MCTP, and yet it was advantageous for us to all use the secure message format. And so that's why we broke those specs apart. Um, we also added a couple more bindings, SPDM over TCP. This is not meant to uh, replace TLS or MTLS. It's really meant for rack management and anyone doing rack and row in a data center kind of thing um, where you need to test the devices and make sure your infrastructure is secure. And then we added SPDM over storage, NVMe, SAS, and SATA, uh, NVMe OFOL as well, um, so that uh, we'd have one common protocol that would be good for both the control plane and data plane, whether that data plane be a bus, a fabric, or a storage uh, infrastructure. So now I'll uh, go on to the uh, features that are in SPDM 1.4. The big feature that we added was PQC, post-quantum cryptography support, and algorithm negotiation certificates and key pair key exchange messages. Uh, we added ML Chem, ML DSA, and SLH DSA, FIPS 203, 204, and 205 support, um, and everything that was required to go along with that. And that included certificate slot management. We realized that you were going to probably uh, allow both traditional algorithms as well as PQC algorithms in an implementation. So we needed a way of dealing with uh, all of the keys and certificates that may not be swapped in right now. And I'll go over what that means in a future slide here in just a second. Um, we, we created a banking uh, what we call a bank of certificates. So if you've followed SPDM so far, you know that you have eight slots, but those eight slots are dependent upon the algorithm negotiated. And now we're adding multiple different algorithms. We're expecting the devices to support multiple algorithms. So we needed a way of dealing with all of the certificate slots. And then we did a bunch of miscellaneous features. If We use GitHub for our spec development. So if any feature is ready when the major feature for the specification is ready and we've already agreed with it and uh, merged it in, that goes out with a, a, any release. That goes with a whole bunch of errata fixes and we release previous versions of errata fixes as well at the same time. Um, but other miscellaneous features here were um, set care, key pair reset cap. Um, to figure out if you allowed the set key uh, pair reset and then added salt length requirements for RSA PSS schemes so that we could uh, be interoperable there, as well as a bunch of minor clarifications and fixes. If you go to the end of the SPDM specification, you can see the detailed history for every release. So post-quantum specifically, uh, if you've paid attention to the NIST uh, requirements coming up, and uh, the deadlines that they've imposed, which are rather aggressive, we felt we needed to get a version of SPDM 1.4 that supported the PQC algorithms. So we support FIPS 203 MLChem for key encapsulation so that you can have uh, PQC safe uh, encryption. And then we added uh, MLDSA and SLHDSA, FIPS 204 and 205 for digital signature. Um, so we added 204 for all the security categories and 205 for all parameter sets. Uh, we also included the NIPS, NIST, a reference to NIST SP800227, which has the recommendations for the key encapsulation mechanisms. So we don't actually define any of the um, uh, algorithms or, or specific recommendations. Instead, we reference other specs. The same is true for the certificates, uh, the OIDs that are out there for the certificates. We don't include them in our spec. Instead, we, we reference them. 
there's no hybrid support in SPDM 1.4. I know there are some uh, open source and, and other solutions out there that went for hybrid before PQC, but we went for PQC before hybrid. So you negotiate algorithms and algorithms can't negotiate two or more algorithms simultaneously for any given category, either digital signature or, or key exchange. Instead, you've either got to be traditional or hybrid. And there were a number of reasons why we chose that, um, particularly that there wasn't going to be a standard certificate format or a standard uh, way to do the keys. Do you concatenate them? Do you include one in the other? It's encapsulated. Um, not having anyone out there in the industry to reference um, nor seeing anyone else uh, do work before us, we decided to um, not put hybrid support in 1.4. Um, if you want to see hybrid support, we do have a way to give the MTF feedback, and we would like to know if that's something of interest to you. There was a really big impact on uh, SPDM because of the really big messages in uh, PQC. If you paid attention to the key sizes and the hashes and, uh, oh my gosh, those, those things are getting really big. So we had to expand uh, fields and certificates to support PQC. And then um, any message that could be large, um, like the key exchange, because that would carry the keys and, and the negotiated keys, and then slot management. Well, each of the slots suddenly got the data in them got very big. Uh, negotiated algorithms, set certificates, set key pair info, and key pair info, again, all got really big because uh, all of the data around PQC gets really big as well. And the same is true for the messages that carry uh, MLDSA and SLHDSA. Any of our signature, digital signature messages, we made sure we accommodated the large digital signatures. When we did SPDM 1.1, these signatures were all pretty small. And uh, we could do them in, you know, we felt confident doing them in an average packet length, you know, 4K or less. Well, with some of these 64K uh, signatures, uh, there's just, we had to do a way of making our messages bigger. So it blew our, some of our length fields out. And so what you're seeing here is the, the um, messages that were affected that had a length field in them that was affected by post-quantum. Um, and the same, of course, is true with the ML cam on the key exchange and key response. So um, that's kind of the biggest impact on a lot of these messages. As you go through and look at them, you'll notice both a small size and a large size. Most of them are done this way. And then you'll see a bit in there that tells you, am I doing a large length or a small length? Um, so we kept some backwards compatibility in there. And if your key doesn't really need you to use a large length, you don't have to use it. Um, but there's ways of negotiating it and uh, finding out the capabilities up front. Um, so um, make sure you follow the specification when it comes to how to deal with the length field changes. I talked about earlier a little bit about certificate slot management with bank. Uh, to, today, many devices support only one algorithm uh, when, when signing algorithm. A, a device can have up to eight slots. But really, that was eight slots eight, for eight certificate chains for each algorithm. And depending on which algorithm you had negotiated, that was the bank of slots that you got. It wasn't really exposed intentionally that way. It's just the way the SPDM worked. So they were implicitly selected via negotiate algorithms and algorithms, providing really no way of managing the other banks of certificates. So what we did was we added a, a command where you can go and say, hey, for my set cert or dealing with key or any of the others, I don't want to deal with a bank of uh, slots that was selected via negotiate algorithms. I want to deal with a separate bank of slots. So I could be using you know, ECDSA P256 that's the one I negotiated, but I want to set up MLDSA 87. And so you can find out which bank of slots that algorithm supports, and you can go in and manage those individual certificates as well. So that was kind of a big deal that we went from implicit bank management to explicit bank management with SPDM 1.4. Again, details are in the certificate. You can look up the bank uh, commands, and uh, hopefully that is explanatory to you. Again, if you have any questions, you're always uh, welcome to either um, submit questions to the forum. Uh, we have an online forum. If you go to the uh, dmtf.org slash SPDM, you can find links to the forum as well as the feedback portal. That concludes the uh, um, 
session today. Uh, again, thank you for your time.